So I was saying, now you can hear me, Bravo. Um, that I'm absolutely delighted uh, beyond belief to be having this retrospective of my work here in this country. I've had three of them actually in the Caribbean. And this to me, um, since I'm a New Yorker and I'm American, has meant um, the most to me. Uh, especially uh, the way Utah has hung the different four different decades of my work. She hung it in a very unconventional form, not going, you know, 1970s over here, 1980s over here, etc. But very difficult to hang painting in, in particular mine because the paintings are so active that they would tend to fight with each other if they're not hanging in a certain way. So um, my thank you goes out to Yuta for creating this exhibition and making it possible, and also for Victorio Calazzi who is the actual instigator of the whole thing. He introduced me to Juta, and uh, we all took it from there. Um, so I'm going to tell you about my life uh, story in relation to the paintings. Uh, painters don't just hatch out of an egg and start making abstract pa paintings. Um, I think that part of the problem today is that younger artists who immediately want to be shown in the biggest galleries in New York feel that they can come out of graduate school and show their work and the art dealers who, who show them are delighted because they can use these artists to um, sell their work very cheap and because they're young and unknown. And then it goes to the artist's head. The artist hasn't had time. You need many years when you're young to develop your work. Anyway, this is my own observation and my own idea of what's happening today. And I would like to begin at the beginning. This uh, is a painting that I created in 1973, and it's called Amphora. And the painting actually um, came from a dream. I believe in Jung, Carl Jung's uh, collective unconscious, subconscious. I don't know if you've ever read his autobiography. But in it, he talks about, in our subconscious mind, that we have uh, knowledge of other ancient cultures. And I've seen this coming out in my painting. And uh, in particular, I believe in my dreams and in my subconscious. And I believe in intuition, which is supposedly a dirty word in some parts of the art world. And um, I remember my teacher, Tony Smith, I did my um, thesis with him at Hunter College. And one day he said to me, I'm just going off on a track here about intuition. But one day he said to me, um, he said, I assume you're going to uh, just go and paint like you're doing now. And I said, of course. And he said, well, you're very fortunate because you're a woman. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, women are closer to the idea of the whole feeling of creativity and intuition. And he said, he believed that male artists have to struggle more to get that part, get in touch with that part of themselves. And he said, well, you have a head start because you're a woman. Well, no one ever told me that before. But I always believed in my intuition anyway. And um, 
So anyway, I um, had this dream that I was in a palace in Persia. And I was speaking Persian. And I had a whole life there, and the dream went on and on about, you know, my life there as a young person. And I don't know a word of Persian. I don't even know how to say hello in that language. But I was speaking it. So I um, had an image in the dream of this painting. Because oftentimes in my dreams I get images of part of a painting or or some vision that would be in a painting. And I woke up in the morning and made a drawing that was very related to this painting. And this painting is um, it's over, what is the size here? It's 102 inches, so it's pretty high. And it's about, I guess, seven, seven and a half feet high. And I started to paint that, that dream. And this painting uh, was the forerunner. It predicted, in some strange way, the whole language that I've been using in all the paintings that you'll see <clears throat> in the exhibition. There was a skeleton of the language. It had the linear element. It had images. It had overlapping. So it was a seed a little seed of what was to happen in a fuller sense uh, four decades, for four decades. Um, <clears throat> it's called Amphra. And we can go on to the next one. This is called Ka. Uh, for two decades, I titled paintings according to sounds because the word synesthesia has often been uh, written about my work from uh, art critics. And does anyone know what synesthesia means? Uh, well, for those people who don't, because I didn't know it until I read it about myself, it means that colors have sounds. And on my mother's side of my family, she had four brothers that were all concert violinists. I never learned an instrument, although I studied dance uh, and I studied other art forms. And the whole gene, I guess you could call it, in my, in my history of music, musical family, came out with hearing colors. Uh, Stravinsky was into that, uh, Scriabin, uh, Nassion, famous composers, and uh, Kandinsky wrote a lot about this as well. So uh, it's very important that I tell you this because I'm a colorist. Color is one of the foremost elements of my work, and movement, of course, you see motion in all of my paintings. And uh, so this was an early one from 1974, and Ka is actually a sound that I heard after I finished the painting. I don't really know what I'm titling them until after I finish the painting. And there's one interesting phenomenon uh, about my work related to you. We've all heard of Bob Dylan, the famous uh, singer and musician. Uh, in his basement tapes, he was interviewed, and he was asked, how he wrote his songs. And he said, well, I don't like them. They're given to me. I'm just a medium. Well, I connect with that 100%. Because once I put something into the painting in the beginning, I feel like I'm a medium and it paints itself. That something is going through me and the whole process has started that way. So um, let's go to the next one. This one is called Abingdon. And you're probably wondering, what are these strange, white, jagged spaces in the painting, linear spaces? 
Well, I was in a strange way excavating. I was like an explorer excavating because I don't know if you can see there are lines underneath this. Here you can see some lines underneath it. And we started the oil painting with oil sticks. Has anyone ever seen a big oil stick? Well, basically it's pigment and wax. And you can draw on canvas, you can draw on paper with it. And I have a series of lines, you can see them all up there. So when I scraped back with a palette knife, some of the beginning of the painting showed through. And that meant a lot to me because it was a process of layering, um, which I've had in, in most of my paintings. And the idea of the layering gives you depth, gives depth to the work. And if you notice, there are some, there's a triangle, there's a rectangle, another uh, rectangle shape here. And they look like they're buried in some way. Well, um, as my paintings uh, went from, um, as they grew from one year to another, some of the images got more defined, and some of them got more quirky and um, more of a personal invention. And so anyway, um, I went through a period where I used a certain amount of my energy in the painting. And at that time, when I look back on it, I was angry. And I wanted to use my anger in a very positive way, to create beauty with my anger. And there have been many artists, including Goya, his last paintings of war and witches and all of that. There have been many uh, painters who have turned ugliness into beauty. So we can contemplate on that. And uh, this was a period of when I was very young of having some anger that I had to work out. And I worked it out in some of these paintings. Uh, let's go on to another one. This is from 1980. And I was in two Whitney Biannuals. I don't know if you know what Whitney Biannual is, but it's a big deal group exhibition every year that the Whitney chooses artists, or curators choose artists to be in it. And um, the first Whitney Biannual was actually in the 1970s that I was in, and there were only uh, three women. And all the other artists were uh, males. And I tell you that because I had my own personal struggle with my own identity as a female artist, and how would I survive if I had to give my slides, which I did, to my male artist friends because art dealers were not coming to see women's studios. And I had to invent myself. I didn't have any uh, women teachers for my art classes. And in art history, they didn't talk about George O'Keefe or Agnes Martin or any of the women artists that we all know of today. So I had to invent myself. And in a way, when you have a difficult time and you have to survive, you become stronger, more uh, learned. And if you can get through that without taking opioids or, or something to get you through it, um, you come out the other end as a more rounded human being. And I was very fortunate that I had the drive to do that. Because many women don't, many people, I shouldn't say just women, 
And by the way, I don't consider myself a female painter. I think painters are painter whether they're males or females. But I'm just talking, but I'm just talking about a particular point in time, and I know that um, feminist, uh, feminist artists said to me, well, you're not a feminist artist because you're not painting female Im imagery. And I didn't buy that because I'm painting my own personal imagery. I don't say if it's male or female or whatever it is, it's my own personal, from my own personal soul. And that's it. And the one thing I was born with is stubbornness. So my stubbornness took me a long way because no one was ever going to tell me what to do or how to paint or anything like that. And so uh, that helped me a lot. And also my education when I was in elementary school, I went to Little Earth Schoolhouse. Pete Singer was my music teacher. And at the Little Earth Schoolhouse, I was allowed to play basketball and baseball. I was a tomboy. And no one said to me, you shouldn't be a tomboy. You should just play with dolls. I ran with the guys because to me that was freedom. And, and then he hung all my paintings in the hallway at the school when I was in kindergarten and up to sixth grade. And they would talk to me about my paintings. I remember some of my paintings were about forests with little birds. I put clothes on the birds and hats on the birds. And I invented all kinds of things with these birds. And no one ever said to me, I mean, people would talk to me as if I was doing something important. And so that's why I'm here today with all of my paintings, because at a very young age, I was taught that this was an important thing to do to make pictures. And um, getting back to the women issue, i probably go back to that a couple of times. I know that I've heard studies done of mothers who give their children a subliminal message their girl children uh, a subliminal message that they can't really do what boys do in their life. They can't really automatically become doctors, lawyers, painters, or whatever, because they're girls. And they did famous studies where they interviewed girls and they interviewed boys. And it was a totally different ambition situation. Um, so anyway, I get back to that because part of my identity is this struggle with my paintings and with becoming free. Freedom is something very interesting that has a lot to do with creating art, whether it's painting or choreography or music, composing music. I tell my students with beginning painting in the first class, I um, tell them a story, I ask them about um, how did uh, Mandela survive 27 years in a cell that you couldn't put your arms out, 27 years of hard labor, sleeping on, on rocks. How did he survive? And my students look at me, they don't have an answer. Well, the answer is very simple. The mind is fathomless. You can't lock up the mind. You can lock up a body, but a mind can travel through walls. A mind can travel through prisons. A mind can go anywhere it wants to, if you allow it to. So I started my painting class with that sense of freedom. Because we are prisoners of our minds. Our mind says, oh, we can't do this on a drawing. We can't do that in a painting, because that's too far out. Or someone's going to look at it and say, what does that mean? You know, we have to struggle for our minds to be free in order to create any kind of art. And that's an important element for me. Um, let's do the next one. You can see, by the way, that the space, this is 1980. Can everyone see the difference in the space from the earlier one that we just showed? This is 
uh, flatter, it still has depth, but the concentration is on a flatter plane, a flatter picture plane. And the concentration is more on, on the linear aspect. And by the way, I painted for a whole decade with palette knives. And so that's why you can see the very thick paint here. And that was done, a lot of the paintings of the, of the 80s and the 70s were done on four horses that I put flat and I would walk around them and paint them. And then I would put the canvas up against the wall. So I'd be continually putting it up and taking it down, putting it up and taking it down. Let's see the next part. That's called Iba. And, um, and this one, again, you can see the palette knife. By the way, these are oil, oil sticks. These lines here are oil sticks. So one of these large paintings from that period of time was shown in the second uh, biannual, Whitney biannual that I was in. And it was quite, quite long. And there were 20 women in that show out of, I think, 300 people. Um, so we've come a long way, but not exactly, we're not exactly where we need to be. Um, should we know? This is called Orsea. Again, these are sounds that I heard from the painting when it was finished. And by the way, some, sometimes we need to know how to look at a painting. Has anyone ever heard of the poet Randolph? Famous French symbolist poet? Well, he had the idea that a poem that he would write should only be thought of and read as a thing itself. There was nothing outside of the poem that you needed. You only needed to see the poem as a whole artistic being. And I've always been involved with poetry myself. I mean, I wrote it for 12 years and stopped, but I'm still involved with the poetic image. I've always been involved with the poetic image in my painting. And so when you look at this painting, you can allow it to just be and experience the painting. You don't have to think about anything outside of that painting to experience the painting like you experience music. So it's really a thing in itself. <clears throat> By the way, here you see the images becoming uh, more complex. That's all similar in style to the ones you've just seen. I've always enjoyed the sense of movement in this painting because Oftentimes, I think of air. I think of different elements, air, fire, water, um, in relation to my painting. And this one is very much about air. And I, th I believe that painting is like breathing. That paintings are live beings and they breathe, like you and I. They have their own way of breathing. And so, because they're live beings, um, I enjoy thinking of them that way and creating them that way. Buka. Um, this is a very large one. And I often work large because I like, I have the idea of the body movement. And I studied dance for many years when I was in um, elementary school. And the dance always stays with me 
<clears throat> but I was too shy. I didn't become a dancer because I was too shy to dance in front of an audience. But I would go home alone in the living room and do my own choreography for hours. And so I could see the choreography in my paintings and the dance in my paintings had come from that period because those things never leave you. Betalonia, actually, Betalonia is an ancient Etruscan city in Italy. I was very privileged and very honored to have the Prix de Rome grant, where I painted at the American Academy in Rome and lived there for two years. They gave me um, a studio almost the size of this whole space. It was skylight as well, overlooking Rome. And you can imagine, I was like totally, uh, how can I say it, floating for two years with that kind of a studio. Plus, they gave me money every month. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I rented, um, or at least uh, uh, a car. And for a year, and I was off and running. Because when I got the Prix de Rome, I didn't expect to get it. Because um, they only gave it to two artists in the United States. And after I was a semi finalist and then a finalist, and then they called me for an interview, and I thought, well, I still haven't gotten it. And when I walked into the room, all of these famous artists were around the table and they stood up, including Bryce Martin and Philip Pearlstein, etc. And they said, well, we think you're a great artist. And they shook my hand, and then they said to me, but we have one stipulation. We want to give you this grant, but we have one stipulation. And I said, well, what is that? And they said, well, we expect you to travel. <laughs> Traveling is my thing. So I smiled at them, and I said, that's not a problem. I love to travel. And so I was off and running. I went to Sicily, I went to other places, and uh, I traveled all over Italy. Of course, it all related to my work, because traveling, now I've been to Southeast Asia three times, I've been to India twice, and all of this influences my painting. I think that our country, somehow, unless you travel, you can't really get an idea of the rest of the world. Even if you read about it, traveling, the experience of traveling, and being with other people, seeing other cultures, is such an eye-opener and so inspirational that I encourage everyone here, if you can travel, to go and, and try and um, see how other people live. So, um, Betalonia, uh, ancient Etruscan, I was very involved when I was in Italy and, and living in the American Academy in Rome. I spent 10 summers painting in Siena as well. And um, I sought out all the Etruscan sites in Italy, and they influenced my work. Uh, you can read about the Etruscans, and um, they had a joy of life that was amazing, they loved dance, they loved music. The Romans were very jealous of the Etruscans. And because the Etruscans were free spirits and happy and all of that. So anyway, here's a second. That's a long, around the same uh, period of time in the 80s. And Maga, means um, it's kind of like a, a witch. Some person who practices magic. And so I liked that title. Now we're getting a little bit away from sounds and into different kinds of titles. Um, but you can see the images from the very beginning painting that I showed you where they're mostly just squares and the images are getting more personal. Um, 
a little more quirky. Alas de Olimpo, I spent um, 13 summers painting in the mountains of the Dominican Republic. And uh, the wings of Olympus, this is what it means in Spanish, the wings, I mean in English, the wings of Olympus. And so I traveled to Greece, and um, some Greek mythology influenced my work. Uh, anyway, uh, here is an image which um, is very prominent in the painting, which you can see next door in the exhibition. <clears throat> Merengue del Tigre. Merengue is a dance that they do in the Dominican Republic, and you know what Tigre is tiger. The merengue of the tiger. Um, I was very uh, pleased to be living in the summers in the mountains of the Dominican Republic. I was the only gringo up there um, in this little village. And I was pleased to be there because it had also tropical light. When I opened up the tube book, Academy in Orange, I saw it for the first time. I had never seen it before because the tropical light is very special and makes the colors look prominent. And here we have the dance, the merengue. This is my uh, Greek, my trip to Greece was very inspirational. Delos is a, a island in Greece that's now become like a museum where the Greeks had their chariots and they had trades with all different countries of the world. And they had temples to Isis, they had temples to all different religions because people came, other countries came to Delos to uh, worship their own religions and, and see the beautiful Greek statues and, and trade. And so this is the Aegean Sea. I don't know if anyone's been to the Aegean Sea, but it's a special color, has a special light. And so, of course, this is an invention of a feeling that I had when I was there. So often I'll paint a feeling and I'll use photographs to remember the light, to remember the feeling. But I'm not painting, um, uh, if you were to look at this, you wouldn't know it was Delos. But that was my own reference for myself because it's a form of abstraction. Oracolo is the oracle of Delphi, which I was mesmerized by. When you look at the stones uh, near Delphi, they talk to you, and they send you messages. And it's all very mystical and spiritual. And the stones are alive. And I wanted to paint the feeling that I had when I was there of, of um, this magical place in terms of abstraction. Um, by the way, there's a lot of transparencies in my work. And you're probably wondering, where did I get that idea, or how did the transparencies evolve? Well, they evolved from living in Siena and experiencing the light in Siena, which is veils of transparent light. And when I went to Siena the first time, I painted, uh, I was painting transparencies, but not as much. And so they become more and more uh, entering my work. Arco Iris is Spanish for rainbow. And this was, the light in here was influenced by my Caribbean uh, foray, my forays into the Caribbean to paint there. This is actually in the very beginning of the exhibition of Kajaraho Sun. I went to India twice. And I don't know if anyone's heard of Kajaraho, the famous temples. They're, they're one of the seven wonders of the world. 
They are erotic temples, and they have amazing sculptures, and um, they're not pornographic, but they're very beautiful and erotic. And um, back then, I guess the culture was not afraid to show naked bodies that were um, erotic. And the light there was amazing, and the energy, so I wanted to paint that. That's why it's called Kajarahu Sun. Yangon. Uh, I traveled to Burma, uh, and I was mesmerized by the ancient temple, Buddhist temples there. I went to Mandalay and to Bagan, and this was influenced by my trip to Burma. Again, uh, Hambi is an ancient uh, Hindu city in India. Rather incredible, amazing, um, built of uh, granite stones so that when the Muslims went to destroy it, they couldn't destroy it because of the hard stone. And I spent a number of days there. Again, it's the light and the feeling of energy that I'm painting. Rana Kapoor is also, it's a uh, Jain temple in Rajasthan. And the Jain temples are incredibly beautiful to me, the most beautiful temples I've ever seen in India. And again, it's the inspiration of being there. Was it influenced by my trip to Burma? Mandalay, you've all heard of Mandalay, the road to Mandalay. And uh, I took a 14 hour boat from Bagan to Mandalay. Incredible journey. But here we have the excitement and the mystery that I felt. Also influenced by Burma. Ananda, it's an Indian title. like a shaman in a way, close to the shamans. Because Black Elk, for people who don't know, was a shaman for his Indian tribe. And he would get visions from daydreams or his practical dreams. And the visions would tell him how to tell his people when to plant seeds, when to go to war. They were pretty profound. And I can just be sitting somewhere and get a vision in my mind of a shape and a color. And then I can start painting. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Some of your um, abstractions start to have a lot of reference to literal things. Like it seems like a fridge or like you know, water and things like that. Is that in any way deliberate or do you think that's completely surprising? Some of that is deliberate. Yes, um, in a painting called Alma del Mar, which you saw recently, there, I was walking on the beach at the Dominican Republic, and I loved these sand dollars, so I picked a little one up, and it broke into four parts, and I started to draw it, all the different parts, and one of the major images in that painting came from a drawing from one of the parts. So I feel, because I'm free, my mind is free. I don't have to do this and repeat this or do that and repeat that. I can do whatever I want in my painting. Fortunately. Did 
Very good question. <laughs> I went to NYU undergraduate. Oh, there you go. Well, no, no, I have a story to tell you about that. <laughs> they wouldn't allow me to make abstract paintings there. I had one famous t uh, teacher who was a famous artist, and he'd walk around with a stick, and we were drawing and painting from the figure. And I had an arm flying off the canvas, I had a leg flying off the canvas, and he'd go like this with a stick, and he'd say to me, you can't do that. You can't paint that way. And I kept on doing it. He hated me. We hated each other. And then I applied for Hunter College because I knew. Oh, I applied to Hunter College because I knew that they had abstract painters there as teachers. And that they would allow me to paint abstractly. And so NYU was great for learning about subjects like related that are related to my art, like physics, uh, anthropology, sociology, philosophy. I'm glad that I took all those courses at NYU because I was a more well-rounded person. And in physics, I learned a lot of things that, that I actually paint. If you look at that wall, you can see the molecules moving. Nothing is fixed. And for me, the truth of making my own painting is not to have anything fixed. It's always moving and changing. Yes? So your um, painting process, you work on multiple paintings at a time, or are you focused on one and just bring it to fruition and be back and forth on it? Well, I that? work on one painting at a time, and it's kind of like having two lovers at the same time. If, if you go on to another painting while the first one is still being painted, I can never do that. I'm just totally um, enamored with my painting, so I can't go on to anything else. Maybe it's a fault. I don't know. Um, is Nazca, is that um, reflective of your inspiration in the Nazca lines? Uh, no, it's not. But, well, maybe in a roundabout way. But I've never been there. I've just seen photos. So in that regard, yes, I was influenced by the photos. Yes? paintings, I was struggling not only with anger, but I was on the other side, you know, I believe in yin and yang. They're always the opposites. And so on the other side of the anger was ecstasy. And those paintings are very ecstatic. They're about ecstasy as well. And so um, we're never just one thing. The mind is very complex. And so at the same time that it came out of anger, the painting taught me about ecstasy. And I've been painting ecstasy ever since. I don't need to be angry anymore. We work through things. We're only human. We're not perfect. And we need to follow our emotions as well.
know I brought up dreaming in the first painting, but all your all your paintings are definitely dream centric. So are you ever not dreaming? Well, not all my paintings are dream centric. Um, that was the first initial one. Some of them come from dreams, but now I use more my subconscious. When I'm working, my subconscious becomes my conscious mind. And so it's not that I just go to bed and then I dream up this painting and I dream up that painting. It doesn't work that way. But it's just that particular painting that I pointed out to you in the very beginning was a catastrophic situation where it actually was dreamt. But we use our subconscious in our dreams as well. I mean, that's where the dreams come from. So it's a little bit more complex. Not that straightforward. As I mentioned, my travels and all of them. That's a 